This is the first in a series of videos for anyone interested in T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. I hope you find it useful. The Wasteland is initially a very difficult poem, maybe more so than any other poem. Even for those of us who've been studying this text for years, there is not a consensus as to what Eliot is doing in certain lines of The Wasteland. Now, if you've never read The Wasteland, I recommend you do so prior to watching this or the videos that follow. It's a less than 20 minute read, and there are few poems that compare with your first experience of reading it. For those who have read it, I won't get into why The Wasteland is so difficult. If you're here, I'm assuming it's because you were just as confused yet intrigued as most of us the first time we encountered it. With my approach, I'll begin in two places, not of the poem itself, before moving on to the primary source for this video. My reason for this is the belief that with enough of a background, certain aspects of the poem will not only begin to reveal themselves, but do so more naturally. My focus will be what I call Eliot's plan, which can be drawn from two sources. The first is an excerpt from an essay Eliot wrote called Ulysses' Order and Myth. Eliot says, I have seen nothing which seemed to me to appreciate the significance of the method employed, the parallel to the Odyssey, and the use of appropriate styles and symbols to each division. In using the myth and manipulating a continuous parallel between contemporaneity and antiquity, Mr. Joyce is pursuing a method which others must pursue after him. It is simply a way of controlling, of ordering, of giving a shape and a significance to the immense panorama of futility and anarchy which is contemporary history. Instead of the narrative method, we may now use the mythic method. While Eliot was writing The Wasteland, he drew some inspiration from Joyce's Ulysses. What he liked about Ulysses is how Joyce didn't make something new, but took something old and made it new or how he stuck to the old, tradition, Homer's Odyssey, to express the new, contemporary 20th century society. Many events of Joyce's Ulysses function through this continuous parallel to the events in Homer's Odyssey, and this language of the continuous parallel is similar to the language of simultaneous existence that Eliot discusses in another essay of his, Tradition and Individual Talent. Just as the language of the mythic method is similar to that of the historical sense in the same essay, the historical sense compels a man to write not merely with his own generation in his bones, but with the feeling that the whole of the literature of Europe, from Homer and within it the whole of the literature of his own country has a simultaneous existence and composes a simultaneous order. My reason for mentioning this essay here is that in Tradition and the Individual Talent, Eliot criticizes the critic for calling Joyce, the author of Ulysses, a great undisciplined talent. Eliot actually feels it's the other way around, that Joyce is disciplined. Showing this by using Homer's Odyssey as a way of controlling, ordering, giving shape to his, Joyce's story. Of note before moving forward, the Odyssey is a pagan or mythic text, yet one that Joyce found a way to make coexistent with 20th century life. Keep in mind this bringing together of two disparate things when we get to the wasteland. The second of my two sources of Eliot's plan is near the end of the wasteland, so if you flip to the end, to the beginning of the notes section, you'll see the following. Not only the title, but the plan, and a good deal of the incidental symbolism of the poem were suggested by Miss Jessie O. Weston's book on the Grail legend for Mitchell to Romance. Indeed, so deeply am I indebted, Miss Weston's book will elucidate the difficulties of the poem much better than my notes can do. To another work of anthropology, I am indebted in general, one which has influenced our generation profoundly, I mean the Golden Bough. Anyone who's acquainted with these works will immediately recognize in the poem certain references to vegetation ceremonies. Although Eliot cites both for Mitchell Romance and the Golden Bough, for this video, I'll draw only from for Mitchell Romance. There's a very good reason for anyone who knows about the Golden Bough. The Golden Bough is in a book you can easily read, and this is because the Golden Bough is a 12 volume set. Or if you try to read the Golden Bough to prepare you for the wasteland, it'll seem like the the never-ending scholarship. Also, Weston in her book for Mitchell to Romance quotes all we will need from the Golden Bough. For Mitchell to Romance is a short work, just short of 200 pages. If you're more of an auditory learner, for Mitchell to Romance is available on LibriVox, which provides free public domain books to the public. I'll include a link to both text and audiobook versions of For Mitchell to Romance in the description below. For Mitchell to Romance is much more helpful as per Eliot's note and priority in putting it first for help in understanding the wasteland. Now, does this mean you have to have read For Mitchell to Romance to get the most out of the wasteland? Not necessarily. Fortunately, I'll be covering for Mitchell to Romance in this video. In his Dante essay, Eliot has his helpful quote about Dante's poetry, which is applicable to our situation. Genuine poetry can communicate before it is understood. It is not necessary to understand the meaning first to enjoy the poetry, but that our enjoyment of the poetry makes us want to understand the meaning. So even if you have never read for Mitchell to Romance, parts of the wasteland should still resonate with you. Why does Eliot draw our attention to for Mitchell to Romance and the Golden Bell? Like Joyce's Ulysses paralleling with Homer's Odyssey, Eliot finds his continuous parallel for the wasteland in the vegetation rituals detailed in Weston and Fraser's books. Built into the wasteland and its primary sources is the belief that there are certain age-old inherent tendencies of man's relationship with nature, such as vegetation ceremonies, and a consistency in how man represents these tendencies. These tendencies, mainly their symbols, are just as true today as they were in Eliot's time a century ago, in the ages of the Grail Quest stories hundreds of years ago, as they were thousands of years ago in the original rituals and their close derivatives. Yet with what and how these tendencies and their symbols are represented, changes or is made new to match the cultures representing them. What's an example of these tendencies and 
and their symbols. If we look at the sections of the wasteland, we can get an illustration of this. Early in the notes section, I emphasized the word anthropology. Anthropology is the scientific study of human cultures. Across many cultures is usually a popular reoccurring pattern, and with this in mind, you may or may not have noticed something. We have the titles, The Burial of the Dead, A Game of Chess, The Fire Sermon, Death by Water, and What the Thunder Said. If you've read and remember the poem, you may have an advantage here with one section. How about now? The Four Elements tradition is age old in the West and the East, and it's still present here. Before we look at the Fermitual Romance text itself, keep in mind that we're not interested in the validity of Weston's argument. Her thesis is accepted as a given because Eliot accepted it as a given, and we're interested in Eliot's poem, not Weston's anthropology for its own sake. One other thing, just as we're not focusing on the anthropology, we're also not interested in the psychology. For example, Weston uses phrases like deeply rooted and universal in the discussion of the ritual symbols in the human psyche. How exactly these symbols have entrenched themselves in the psyche to become so universal, she doesn't theorize, partly because she's not a psychologist. We accept it as a given that this phenomenon has happened, and in seeing her thesis that the symbols of the vegetation rituals have remained intact throughout the ages, it is a reasonable claim to accept. Now that we understand Eliot's plan, he's hearkening it back to something old to present in a new way, Let's look at from ritual to romance. Ritual has to do with the prehistoric to antiquity vegetation ceremonies mentioned earlier, while romance covers the Arthurian quest stories for the Holy Grail. In scholarship, the Holy Grail stories are called romances. What's the relationship between ritual and romance? Let's talk about the ritual part first, it being the more integral of the two. In Weston's words, when we have made up our minds as to what the Grail really was and what it stood for, we shall be able to analyze the romances to decide which of them contains more, which less, of the original matter. What is this original matter? Weston continues. I am firmly and entirely convinced that the root origin of the whole bewildering complex is to be found in the vegetation ritual, a life cult, and in that alone. Let's go back a few thousand years in order to appreciate why the rituals existed. Prehistoric peoples were deeply concerned with sources of life, such as crops and animals, and necessary to both, water. And it should go without saying that the sources weren't enough, the sources had to be healthy. And the sources weren't limited to crops and animals, but also human reproductive fertility. This concern of theirs went so deep that it took on a religious, or if you will, spiritual significance to become a cult of life or life cult. As Weston says, what we have need to seize and to insist upon is the overpowering influence which the sense of life, the need for life, the essential sanctity of the life-giving faculty exercised upon primitive religions. Here's another quote, this time Weston quoting Fraser. To quote a well-known passage from Sir Fraser, they commonly believed that the tie between the animal and the vegetable world was even closer than it really is. To them, the principle of life and fertility, whether animal or vegetable, was one and indivisible. Hence, actions that induce fertility in the animal world were held to be equally efficacious in stimulating the reproductive energies of the vegetable. How deeply this idea was rooted in the minds of our ancestors, we, their descendants, may learn from its survival to our own day. The actions that induce fertility were ritual practices, and since ancient peoples were concerned with the fertility of animal and vegetable life, there would come to be natural symbols to represent fertility in their rituals. These symbols are the lance and cup. We know the two most prominent cup and lance to be sex symbols were originally fertility emblems, and as such employed in a ritual designed to promote or restore the activity of the reproductive energies of nature. They are sex symbols of immemorial antiquity and worldwide diffusion, the lance or spear representing the male, the cup or vase, the female reproductive energy. In her book, Weston gives examples of the individual rituals for the lance, for example, the sword dance, which, quote, was designed to promote the fruitfulness of the earth, not to display the skill of the dancers in handling of weapons, end quote, and the cup. However, with the cup, the ritual became more secretive and mysterious, certainly less public. In references to the mysteries but not necessarily the cup, we have this quote from Mr. Langdon, the actual mysteries may have been performed in a secret chamber and consequently the scenes were forbidden in art. This would account for the surprising dearth of archaeological evidence concerning a cult upon which the very life of mankind was supposed to depend. So the lance has a more exoteric presence, while the cup a more esoteric one. Or to quote for more definition, exoteric, in celebrations openly and publicly performed, in which all adherents of that particular cult could join freely, the object of such public rites being to obtain some external material benefit, whether for the individual worshipper or for the community as a whole. Esoteric. Rites open only to a favored few, the initiates, the object of which appears to be, as a rule, to have been individual rather than social and non-material. In some cases, certainly the object aimed at was the attainment of a conscious ecstatic union with the god, and a definite assurance of a future life. In other words, there was the public worship, and there were the mysteries. 
Yet a concrete example of the cup mysteries is, the first and most important point was a mystic meal, at which the food partaken of was served in the sacred vessels. So initiation is part of the cup mysteries, and with the cup there was a meal. Even in rituals in which there was a cup but no meal, such as the case quoted by Weston of the samurai who inherited a cup as a rite of passage into marriage, there was still an initiation ceremony, a very serious one. Here I'll have to gloss over and simplify a bit of material, yet here's the core idea. There is no doubt that a ceremonial marriage very frequently formed a part of the fertility ritual. As an example of this, Weston quotes the ending of a story from the Mahabharata, and as soon as the marriage is consummated, the spell is broken and rain falls in abundance. On a literal level, marriage is the union of male and female, union brings forth insemination, insemination brings forth reproduction. On a symbolic level for the rituals, Lance and Cup were married. This union was to bring forth rain, rain was what was needed to fertilize the land. To quote Jung from Man and His Symbols, in mythology, rain was often thought to be a love union between heaven and earth, in the Eleusinian Mysteries, for instance. So when the land was in a bad way, rituals were practiced to bring forth much desired rain. Water is a crucial element, not only in general, but something we need to understand before moving on to the Fisher King and the Wasteland. So what does West End have to say about water? Their hymns and prayers, and as we have strong reason to suppose their dramatic ritual, were designed for the main purpose of obtaining from the gods of their worship that which was essential to ensure the well-being and the fertility of their land, warmth, sunshine, above all sufficient water. The fundamental idea here seems to be that of the origin of all life from water, a very ancient idea. In modern society, with our easy access to it, water is something that we take for granted. There's a scene in Quantum of Solace where the villain Dominic Green says in relation to his master plan something like, this is the world's most valuable resource. We have to control as much of it as possible. The film has led us to believe that what he's talking about is crude oil, and why wouldn't we believe this? Crude oil is essential to modern living, but what he's in fact talking about is water, which goes deeper and is essential to life. My reason for bringing this up here is as an illustration that water is just as important to us as it was to early peoples, except for them to the point where it was something that was prayed and hoped for, and I think this has been true for the larger part of human history. In connection with water, we also need to take note of tarot cards. All of us at least know of tarot cards. Regardless of our opinions of them today, tarot cards had an even deeper significance thousands of years ago, according to Weston, but if the connection with the Egyptian and Chinese monuments referred to above is genuine, the original use of the tarot would seem to have been not to foretell the future in general, but to predict the rise and fall of the waters which brought fertility to the land. And of course, there's the tie-in between fertility and our traditional symbols, with the cup becoming the hearts, the lance the diamonds, the sword the spades, and the dish the clubs. So far we've looked at the rituals and their symbols, but as with any ritual of religious significance is directed at something of religious significance. Yes, primitive peoples were concerned about the land and the vitality of its resources, but these things are merely material, or better put, seemingly no one directs a ritual of religious significance to something of only material significance unless it also has something beyond its material significance. And again, early people's concern for their sources of life went deep. So these rituals are directed at the Fisher King. The reason why he's called the Fisher King is actually interesting if you're interested in comparative religions. Obviously later the fish became connected with Christ. Prior to this, the fish symbol was used in the Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, and other major world religions traditions. But to our point, Weston says, so far as the present state of our knowledge goes, we can affirm with certainty that the fish is a life symbol of immemorial antiquity, and that the title Fisher has, from the earliest ages, been associated with deities who were held to be specially connected with the origin and preservation of light. As for the king and Fisher King, he was the man whose life and virility was believed to be closely bound up with the fertility of the land. For this, he could not be a mere man, but the spirit of vegetation, a divine reincarnation. We have to be careful to not mistake these beliefs and rituals as solely a thing of the past. In her book, Weston gives several accounts of African, European, and Russian cultures who still believe in the Fisher King, or at least still practice rites involving the Fisher King, even if in effigy. Across all these cultures, there is a consistency. If the king is doing well, the land would do well. If the king is in ill health, the land would suffer. As with any story, there's a problem. The Fisher King is ill or even dead, so the ceremonies are performed to restore him to health or life, so as to restore the land to health or life. As we transition from the rituals to the romances, here's some context to keep in mind. This is a point which has hitherto escaped the attention of scholars. The misfortunes of the land have been treated rather as an accident than as essential of the Grail story, entirely subordinate in interest to the dramatis personae of the tale or the objects Lance and Grail, around which the action revolves. As a matter of fact, I believe that the wasteland is really at the very heart of our problem. In the romances, the knights or the questers did not go on the adventure for the grail simply to have a good time, or for something to do. No, there was something wrong that necessitates the quest, mainly the land being in waste. The reason the land is in waste is because the king is ill, hence again our connection between the king's health and the land's health, and it is believed the holy grail can restore him to health. According to Weston, the grail romances weren't stories that simply sprang from the imaginations of their creators, instead they're the remains of the vegetation ceremonies and Christian garbs. Here's a quote for perspective. Further, we find in that belief a 
tendency to express itself in certain ceremonial practices which retain in a greater lesser degree the character of the ritual observances of which they are the survival. Mr. Chambers in the Medieval Stage remarks, If the comparative study of religion proves anything, it is that the traditional beliefs and customs of the medieval or modern peasant are in nine cases out of ten but the detritus of heathen mythology and heathen worship, enduring with but little external change in the shadow of a hostile faith. We may, I think, take it that we have established at least the possibility that in the girl romances we possess in literary form, an example of the detritus above referred to, the fragmentary record of a secret ritual of a fertility cult. So why did the romance authors who were more or less Christian in creating the romances take over what is inherently pagan life cults? First, these cults, long-standing popular ones, were already on the scene, so it had been difficult, if not impossible, for them to not exercise some influence on early Christianity, at least its symbols. Secondly, and more important for our purposes, we again go back to the deep-rootedness that these life cults spoke to. If the life cults' needs, and early Christians' needs, both spoke to man's deep need for life, capital L life, why wouldn't some romance authors, whether consciously or subconsciously, see the story of the passion as an extension or fulfillment of prehistoric vegetation rituals? Still, the romances rewrote in romance would have been known as fertility rituals, and if we look at the close parallels between the elements of both, we see, in the symbols, a semblance of the former in the latter. The lance becomes the sphere of destiny, the cup becomes the holy grail, the mystic meal becomes the Eucharist, water becomes Christ's words in John 4.13 which read, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whoever drinketh of this water shall never thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the fisher king becomes Christ the fisher of men. Since we finally covered the romance symbols, let's focus on one important final element of the romances, the perilous chapel. The perilous chapel is an episode in which the quester, in his quest for the grail, takes refuge, either in fatigue or from a storm, in an abandoned chapel. Keep in mind that there is more than one romance, and some of them, the perilous chapel is the perilous cemetery, or both. Yet in the key romances, the perilous chapel presents the quester with dangers and horrors. There are strange and threatening voices, and the general impression is that this is an adventure in which supernatural and evil forces are engaged. Since much of Wesson's discussion of the perilous chapel episode details her belief that the perilous chapel had at one point a real-world basis, going deeper into what she says detracts from our intended focus. So to connect what's relevant to the fertility rituals, I will quote the following. Some years ago, I offered the suggestion that the test for the primary initiation, that into which the sources of physical life, would probably consist in a contact with the horrors of physical death, and that the tradition of the perilous chapel, which survives in the girl romances in a confusing contaminated form, was a reminiscence of a test for this lower initiation. The sense of mystery, of a real danger to be faced, of an overwhelming spiritual gain to be won, or of the essential nature of the tale. It was the very mystery of life which lay beneath the picturesque wrappings, small wonder that the quest of the grail became the synonym for the highest achievement that could be set before men. The knowledge of the grail was the utmost man could achieve, author's knights were the very flower of manhood, it was fitting that to them the supreme test be offered, that the man who first told the story, and boldly, as befitted a born teller of tales, wedded it to the Arthurian legend. If we recall, the cup rituals were more esoteric, and generally involved initiation. In the Perilous Chapel episode, the quester in search of the Holy Grail is being tested by horrors before admittance into higher spiritual mysteries. Although this is an oversimplification of what Weston says, it is entirely sufficient for what we need before looking at the wasteland. But here's a quote. We have already seen in the Nasain document that the mystery ritual composed a double initiation, the lower into the mysteries of generation, i.e. physical life, the higher into the spiritual divine life, where man is made one with God. When we get to the poem, you may be reminded of this quote. I think it should have read like this. So if we go back to our close parallels, we can now add the perilous chapel. The initiation into higher mysteries becomes the perilous chapel test. Now there is another element from the romances I'd like to suggest, but only suggest, because Weston does not mention this element in her book. This element might be more unique to the romances and the rituals, and this element is a sage figure, like Merlin, who helps the quester on his journey. Keep the sage figure in mind when we get to the wasteland. In closing, I'd like to draw your attention to the following quotes. This close relation between the ruler and his land is a deeply rooted popular belief of practically immemorial antiquity and inexhaustible vitality. We can trace it back thousands of years before the Christian era. We find it fraught with decisions of life and death today. But of this one thing we may be sure, the grail is a living force, it will never die. It may indeed sink out of sight and for centuries even disappear from the field of literature, but it will rise to the surface again and become once more a theme of vital inspiration even as, after slumbering from the days of Mallory, it woke to new life in the 19th century, making its fresh appeal through the genius of Tennyson and Wagner. 
Near the time of this statement, Elliot would be the latest to take up this living force with a fresh appeal. Yet for those who have read The Wasteland and know of the Grail legends, you may not have noticed much reminiscent of the Grail. This is because as one scholar remarked, the Wasteland functions more as a from romance to ritual, so keep in mind the ritual symbols for next time. The Fertility Cult, Lance and Cup, Water, Tarot Cards, The Fisher King, The Perilous Chapel, and The Sage. In the next video, we'll analyze the first section of the Wasteland, The Burial of the Dead. So if you found this video helpful, please give it a like and join me next time.